Hello everyone. Uh, to those who didn't uh, attend the previous panels, you are with the second day of the Chernian Security Forum. My name is Dr. Asya Metodieva. I am a researcher at the Institute of International Relations in Prague. We really wanted to uh, welcome all our speakers and of course uh, the audience in Prague, but unfortunately due to the COVID-19 related restrictions, this is impossible. However, all of you are uh, able to attend our discussions today, today online and of course to participate with comments and questions which you can do through our website, the Institute of International Relations in Prague and the Slido application, so please use this opportunity. This year's conference is devoted to digital transformation and the way we adapt to all the changes uh, related to cybersecurity and digital space in the recent in the past two years uh, under the the conditions of uh, of global pandemic when many people switched to uh, to online communication and many of our activities transformed and uh, shifted to to the digital world the panel uh, which begins now is devoted to political surveillance uh, in times of digital transformation with a particular focus on the cases of Russia and China. And I invite you to, to stay with us because we have a great selection of, of speakers uh, with whom we are going to, to comment how surveillance is used by governments for intelligence gathering and more specifically how COVID-19 basically incentivized all these processes. Information operations, as we know, play a central role uh, in um, authoritarian regimes, especially uh, when it comes to Russia and, 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 and China. And such powers further use the digital transformation to advance their political surveillance capabilities. How, do, uh, the how does the Chinese approach differs from, from the Russian ones? Uh, is there a space for cooperation with the West in times of uh, power competition uh, and increasing threats of cyber warfare? These are the questions of, of uh, the panel and let me introduce our speakers. I would like to, uh, to, to welcome Dr. Daniela Flong, who is a Max Weber Fellow at the European uh, European University Institute in Florence. She focuses on internet governance and content control norms. She received her PhD in governance from a heritage school in Germany. Formerly, she worked on a research project called Evolving Internet Interfaces, Content Control and Privacy Protection. As a Max Weber Fellow, Daniela works uh, on a two-year project on the internet and external contestations of the open internet order. She explored the securitization of internet content in the European Union as a legitimation strategy for increased regulation. Uh, our second speaker, Valentin Weber, is a research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations in the Technology and Global Affairs Programme. His research covers the emergence of cyber norms, the geopolitics of cyberspace, advanced surveillance technologies, and more broadly, the intersection between cyber and national security. In 2019, uh, Valentin was an Open Technology Fund Senior Fellow in Information Controls uh, with the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. He's currently at the final stage of uh, his PhD studies at the University of Oxford. Dr. Lauren Johnson is a senior lecturer at the Institute of International Trade at uh, the University of Adeline. Founding director of New South Economics, Johnson's research and publications focus, uh, focuses on China's trade and investment ties, especially uh, with, with Africa. Uh, and um, uh, Last but not least, uh, Elisabetta Gaufman uh, or Lisa Gaufman. Uh, she's an assistant professor of Russian discourse and politics at the University of Groningen. After completing her PhD uh, there, she spent three years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Intercultural and International Studies at the University of Bremen. She is the author of uh, Security Threats and Public Perception, Digital Russia and the Ukraine Crisis. 
Very interesting, uh, as I said, selection of speakers. I would like to uh, welcome everyone and uh, to say that each of you will have up to 15, 16 minutes to uh, do your uh, introductory speeches. And of course, after that, we're gonna have time for discussion and questions from, uh, from our audience. Once again, everybody who is with us online, please write your comments uh, on our Slido application at the Institute of International Relation Relations. You're gonna find it on our website. Daniela Flong, please, the floor is yours. I would like to, to start the discussion uh, with, with you. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think we had some great discussions so far and I'm really looking forward to our discussions today. Um, what I wanna to do today is set out how Russia and China promote and develop international norms on information security. And the starting point of my argument is that there's an important international dimension to, to authoritarianism. Um, I argue that Russia and China promote information security norms in regional and international organizations. And I basically wanna set out this argument in four steps. So. First, what are information security norms? Second, um, to what extent do Russia and China have a similar approach? Third, what strategies do they use for norm promotion? And finally, what are the consequences of this for the open internet order? So what are these information security norms? Basically, information security has three aspects. Um, Russia and China define information security um, in a very broad way, since it entails the status of individuals, society, and the state. Uh, when they are protected from threats, destructive, and other negative impacts in the information space. And the threat could include any kind of information that's harmful to social, political, and economic systems. So it's defined in a very broad way, and it's often used to legitimize internet censorship and surveillance. Um, then Russia and China try to reorder the internet via content regulation and surveillance, whereby states are basically the core actors that should keep order in cyberspace. And then finally, they also argue that global cyberspace should be governed by an intergovernmental model under UN institutions. And they label these institutions as democratic since they are based on the principle of one country, one vote. So what I wanna focus on today is the spread of these norms by Russia and China in regional and international organizations. And I argue that pro by promoting these norms, Russia and China are basically normative challengers that try to uh, change the global internet governance. Okay, so basically what are, I want to discuss first, what are the differences and similarities between Russia and China? So you could argue that Russia and China are different in two ways. First, Russia has a more decentralized internet infrastructure uh, than China, and therefore Russia is relatively more dependent on legislation um, than on technical capabilities for censoring and surveilling the internet. Second, Russia is also an electoral autocracy and China is a more close autocracy, right? So therefore, of the two countries, you could argue that China is basically the least likely case for information security norm promotion um, because a country like China would be less dependent on international norms and principles. Um, so this is how they're different, but I would still argue that Russia and China are still similar in two important ways, making them very relevant cases. First, they take a similar stance on information security and actively promote norms accordingly. And second, they do so in different regional and international organizations. And this is what makes them interesting for us to look at. Okay, so what are these strategies? So I think if we look at how Russia and China promote information security norms, we see different strategies in regional and international organizations. So in regional organizations, and this could be the BRICS, the Collective Security and Treaty Organization, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we see that Russia and China try to socialize like-minded countries. So Russia and China socialize like-minded states by including them into a regional group by erasing their status and reputation, but also by praising non-conforming behavior. And they refer to, to member states of these organizations as companions, like as friends, partners, allies, authoritative members in the development of these norms. Uh, they complement other member states' compliant behavior and position towards information security. But they also improve their relationships in these regional organizations by exchanging expertise, providing technical assistance, and working on capacity building. For instance, one of the major areas of cooperation in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization um, is exchanging experience, the training of specialists, the organizations of meetings, conferences, and other forums in this field. Uh, with regard to countering terrorism, for instance, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization member states cooperate in the regional anti-terrorist structure, also called RATS, 
Um, and here they collect and analyze data. They maintain a data bank on terrorists, separatists, and extremist actors. They conduct operational and technical exercises. Um, and very similarly, since 2009, the Collective Security and Treaty Organization is carrying out joint operation in Operation Proxy, uh, which is focused on con countering information crimes. So via this program, the Collective Security and Treaty Organization identifies and basically censors certain information resources in member states. And in this operation, uh, Russia provides practical assistance to law enforcement agencies, exchanges expertise, and assists in the development of specialized units. So we see that there's a lot of uh, cooperation going on in regional organizations um, in this area, and that Russia and China provide a lot of input and assistance. Um, and I argue that these socialization mechanisms kind of lead to this taken for grantedness among member states of these regional organizations whereby often this norm of information security is no longer contested, but expressed collectively. And this makes it way easier for Russia and China to promote these norms in, on an international level. So in international organizations such as the UN, but also the World Internet Conference, we see that Russia and China have to persuade less like-minded states. So non-like-minded target groups in these international organizations have to be convinced of the validity of arguments. Um, they have to be persuaded um, into supporting new norms. And in order to make a convincing argument, Russia and China often use frames. Um, they use security frames to find common ground with liberal democracy. They often use uh, development frames to resonate with developing countries. Um, for instance, cyber terrorism and cyber crime are seen as legitimate reasons for governing the internet by Western states. And these policy fields provide a common ground for developing norms. They resonate with a broader and liberal audience and circumvent problematic hurdles, such as the direct challenge of online freedom of expression. Russia and China also link information security to broader principles and existing norms. Um, so one pr principle that China and Russia often refer to is that they want to make global internet governance more democratic and based on one country, one vote principles. And in order to achieve um, equitable development, global internet governance should be multilateral, transparent, democratic, and based on this idea that the future of cyberspace should be in the hands of all countries. So therefore they refer to a position taken by many developing countries that existing norms do not reflect the interests of the majority of countries. And it's kind of interesting because by referring to democracy and equitable representation, Russia and China are actually trying to push internet governance away from multi-stakeholderism and towards intergovernmentalism. Um, other broader principles that Russia and China often link norms to are um, development, the fight against digital inequality, but also countering U.S. hegemony. So, so far I've set out these like different strategies, so the socialization and the spiritualization strategies for developing information security norms. However, Russia and China also combine these strategies by sequencing them. So what they do, they first build these regional coalitions, and after that they promote norms in a more diverse global context. After they build a critical mass in a regional context, they negotiate broader support on an international level. And a very well-known example of this, um, of this sequencing approach, is the promotion of the Code of Conduct for Information Security. So what happened in 2011, there were four strong cooperation organization member states, namely China, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, that proposed this Code of Conduct to the UN General Assembly. And the Code of Conduct calls on states to cooperate on the restriction of the distribution of information relating to terrorism, successionism, or extremism, or undermining other countries' political, economic, and social stability. So this code did not get any global backing in 2011. However, information security norms gave more support on a regional level, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization member states considered it important um, to continue efforts uh, aimed at co-authoring a newer version of this code. And in 2015, we see that all six Shanghai Corporation Organization member states uh, submitted a revised version of this code to the General Assembly. This was China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And they framed this code of conduct in a very specific way at the UN. So according to China, achieving a consensus on international norms is necessary and in the security interests of all countries, given the frequent incidents in cyberspace. According to Russia, the objective of the code of conduct is to define the rules of responsible behavior by states 
in the light of emerging cyber threats and challenges of military, political, terrorist, and criminal in nature. And the reference to security interests shows how norm entrepreneurs try to securitize internet governance in a broad, broader global context. So, so this revised code of conduct did not contain that many challenges, changes and was again not supported by all UN member states. Nevertheless, the two codes are noted in several uh, UNGGE reports acknowledging the norm development efforts by the Shanghai Corporation Organization. And I think this case illustrates very well how Russia and China are building coalitions with like-minded states on a regional level and basically use these coalitions to develop norms on an international level. Therefore, I think we can argue that regional cooperation does not only improve national information security practices, but also strengthens international norm promotion activities. So finally, how does this relate to like this broader contestation of the open internet order? So to conclude, Russia and China are normative challengers that try to change global internet governance. This push for information security norms is part of a larger conflict about the openness of the internet. So on the one hand, we see that there's this illiberal sphere, often led by Russia and China, and the actors in the sphere are mostly in favor of information security and intergovernmentalism. Then on the other hand, there's this liberal sphere, often led by the US and the EU member states, and this sphere is more in favor of freedom, free speech, uh, protection of human rights, multi-stakeholderism. And whereas this liberal sphere used to be very reluctant to regulate many internet policy areas for a long time, it seems that, this tide, that the tide is turning a bit in this area. So policymakers in the US and the EU are increasingly skeptical of private internet governance. They're increasing call, calls for countering terrorist content and dips of information. Um, and therefore, countries like Russia and China are continuing the promotion of information security norms and sometimes succeed in doing so. And at the same time, many of these liberal democracies are moving towards more regulation and a more important role for states in internet governance. And I think we can argue that the internet was never really without regulation, but we do witness increased legalization of the internet. And not only do we see increased reg regulation, there's also this move towards nationalization and regionalization. So nationally, we see increased internet censorship and surveillance uh, in both liberal democracies and autocracies. And regionally, there's an increased exchange of expertise um, on information security norms and practices, what I just discussed, like in the um, Shanghai Corporation Organization and the Collective Security and Treaty Organization. And I think of these shifts and the conflicts that come with these shifts, China and Russia promote information security norms actively, consistently, and over time. And this shows that the internet order that was one, once considered to be open and liberal is increasingly contested by these actors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting um, um, presentation to the like the key arguments, uh, which also appear in uh, in your um, recent publication. And I I would maybe pick one of the aspects that you touched upon to uh, to ask you to elaborate a bit further on it. Uh, what do you think this like support that uh, Russia and China are basically? looking for at, uh, at the regional level when it comes to, uh, to information norms? What are the, uh, the implications of, of this support? Like implications for whom? Implications for, democracy. for democracy, implications for uh, the, the, like the, the, the framework we, we need to basically uh, to regulate internet and, uh, and the way these countries behave uh, in relation to, to the online and the cyberspace. So I think especially that they use these coalitions to go to uh, international organizations is an like an interesting development, right? Um, and I think what we often forget is that, I think we also saw it on the um, the revision of the International Telecommunication Relate, uh, Regulations uh, Treaty in 2012, um, where basically this coalition of authoritarian states, but also developing states, got a majority to revise um, a, a whole treaty, right? And often what we forget, I think, in liberal democracies in, in, in Europe is that often liberal democracy is in the minority in the world. So actually these authoritarian states trying to build these stronger coalitions and kind of expanding their reach um, in the world is a, is a development that is really going on and might 
actually, at, on, like on the long term, establish norms like information security norms. I think the interesting part about these norms is that it's actually a very hollow way of developing norms, right? If we think about norms, we often think about um, strong norms like protection of human rights, freedom of speech. And basically, these norms are not necessarily about that every country in the world should have information security, but at least that there's this international norm out there that could legitimize these practices on a national and a regional level. Um, so I think this re like regional cooperation will continue, um, which means there will be increased exchange of expertise. Um, but and, and that that really would like that does make uh, internet censorship and surveillance more effective. But at the same time, I think we can also see that these co they will increasingly try to push these coalitions in international organizations, um, which basically fosters this closing up of the internet as this open and liberal space. Maybe also we can talk about uh, like enhancing the voices of Russia and China uh, in a sense of like gaining um, e expanded uh, support from uh, from other countries and from other actors to to apply this uh, information uh, information norms. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this presentation. Uh, I would like to now give the floor to Valentin Weber uh, for his introductory remarks. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hastia. <clears throat> Thank you for having the opportunity to be here. Um, it's really um, nice to um, um, also um, already to have had some multilateral um, inputs here from um, Danielle, and I'll add something more on the um, country-specific uh, measures that are taken within China and Russia. <clears throat> so surveillance in China is um, very much, um, as we all know, high tech, right? So since the early 2000s, there's really been a um, strong segregation of information content from the domestic content um, towards the vis-a-vis um, -vis the um, international content. And um, China was really able to do to, to segregate this um, information space because it has the market size. Um, it does have um, hundreds, if not a billion, um, internet users that um, create homegrown content. Um, it does have um, several homegrown companies, um, such as Weibo, we WeChat, uh, or Renren, which are um, mirror in some ways um, Twitter um, and Facebook and other uh, Western platforms. And so because there is such a um, homegrown content, but also homegrown um, supply and demand for information, we've really seen that there is not such a demand for foreign content. So China doesn't really need to negotiate with Western companies uh, when it wants them uh, to remove content. So it's rather um, the other way around. If um, China wants um, surveillance on, on, on users or uh, if it wants to implement those measures, then um, Western companies often overcomply. We've seen that with Yahoo, which entered the market very early, um, it had to um, turn over data of journalists and so on, which then led to their arrest. And uh, recently, Yahoo, Yahoo left, actually, because of new um, data regulations um, in China, and so did LinkedIn. But um, Western companies still do comply with, um, with surveillance within China, for instance, Apple, one of the largest play, uh, players um, there of the Western companies or American companies, um, it stores, for instance, data of um, Chinese users on servers run um, by state-owned state -owned company uh, in Guiyan. Um, and the encryption keys, they're stored um, in China as well. So um, they're really playing part um, in that surveillance apparatus. Um, so to sum up here, um, the, the um, surveillance within China, it's really, we can see that it builds on a large digital economy that collects massive amounts of data, uh, whether it's your daily commute, um, health data, or financial data, and it's then used um, for surveillance purposes. Uh, within, uh, within Russia, uh, on the other hand, it's much more of a, um, it's a different picture. We do have um, large-scale surveillance happening in Moscow, um, where we have around 175,000 cameras equipped uh, with uh, face recognition software 
um, those have been used actually um, have been justified during the COVID pandemic to um, enforce quarantine rules. At the same time, we have seen indication that these uh, facial recognition cameras were also used to identify protesters that marched in support um, of Alexei Navalny. So in the Moscow metro, for instance, you can use uh, you can use um, very, very recently they've introduced that you can use uh, face recognition to gain entry. You don't have it, but it looks like it's being rolled out quite quite um, strongly. Um, what's interesting here is as well that the access to surveillance data um, within Russia is not that well managed. Um, it appears that you can buy access to live footage and you, that you can search for facial recognition matches uh, for only a few euros um, on certain internet fora. Um, what is also worth emphasizing is that uh, major initiatives uh, that we see appearing are really um, limited to Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, a lot of other Russian cities don't um, follow um, yet that strongly that um, approach which they take. So the majority of Russia really has a kind of a low tech um, approach to surveillance and um, can see it being implemented across Russia in, in such a way. But I think that since at least um, 2012, um, we can see a process of sanitization of Russia's surveillance approach, which means that Russia is becoming more like um, China. Um, so it is becoming harsher, it is becoming more stringent. Um, and um, why 2012? So in 2012, we've seen large scale anti government protests um, in Russia appearing. Um, so as a response, um, the authorities introduced a blacklist of websites that are to be banned um, and slowly started also to seal itself off from the global internet um, in that way, right? So they are kind of producing their own um, black, uh, uh, like their own censored lists. So on at the same time, um, we have seen VPNs um, having restrictions, right, um, by the authorities in Russia. But more recently, we've really seen that they've also started implementing um, these restrictions and we've seen a harsher crackdown there. What's interesting here as well, why is uh, Russia becoming a bit more uh, like China is that it gets a lot of hardware for its um, fish recognition cameras, for instance, from China. So it's relying more um, on the tech that's coming there. It uses native um, software that's produced in Russia, but the hardware is really coming from there. This is also a measure probably to, um, uh, to it's a, probably also a bit of a national security measure to kind of restrict um, data flowing perhaps outside the country. So, but Russia has faced um, some challenges in, in implementing these new measures. Uh, it's really struggling with the digitization of surveillance apparatus, with, with the digitization of the police um, and of its, um, Internet authorities, we've seen that during the Telegram ban, where Telegram as a response to uh, being blocked has used uh, domain fronting, which means that Telegram has started hiding its traffic within Google and Amazon traffic. And so as a result, when Roskomnadzor took um, on to um, Telegram, they also blocked IP addresses from Google and Amazon. More lately, we've seen Russia trying to um, to bring into compliance also Twitter with regards to content. So it has used a technology called deep packet inspection technology to throttle traffic, which means that it wanted to slow down Twitter traffic and thereby also kind of um, making people uh, go less on onto Twitter services because it would be just too slow. But in that way, it also brought, um, blocked not only Twitter traffic, or it did not only throttle tr Twitter traffic, but also it affected some uh, Microsoft.com and Reddit.com um, domains. Um, while we can see these kind of um, still um, problems on the horizon of implementing uncensorship, um, we, we also can perceive that Russia does not have yet has a detailed data on its citizen, citizens as um, China does um, for um, um, in, in most instances. So I think that also makes the difference in how you then do surveillance, right? If you have a certain amount of data, you can do difference. Um, you can take different actions as a government. 
there is um, cooperation occurring between China and Russia. Um, that was in 2015. They signed a um, cybersecurity treaty in which they laid out bilateral cooperation terms. Um, they um, talked about the exchange of information and cooperation when it comes to law enforcement investigative cases, uh, when it involves information and communication technologies, uh, again, for terrorist and criminal purposes. Um, again, it depends how you define terrorism and criminal um, behavior, right? Um, in 2019, so four years later, um, China and Russia signed an international treaty for managing illegal content online. So you can see there is um, steady cooperation in that aspect as well. But it's not only um, Russia and China cooperating. I think on a multilateral um, or also on a um, company level, actually, a lot of Western companies collaborate with Chinese and Russian um, businesses, but also with um, security um, authorities. Uh, we've seen Nokia implementing some kind of um, internet surveillance also in, in Russia. Um, and that, that's right, a bit more um, contentious. So there is cooperation um, that we probably wouldn't like to um, be um, is occurring. So in a previous report that a colleague and I um, wrote, we actually found a lot of American technologies uh, being used by Chinese police. Um, and uh, whether that's now um, software from IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, databases, uh, we've found it all across China, including in Xinjiang. So here again, um, there shouldn't be such cooperation, we think, and I think that these companies need to do a better due diligence when um, propping up the surveillance apparatus there. Um, in addition, um, we can see a lot of tool use technologies being used in um, the surveillance apparatus. And um, whether it could be, for instance, geopositioning technologies, right? You can use it um, for civilian purposes. You can use it in the police, right? To um, increase um, smart police capabilities, but you can also use it in the military um, to um, fire off uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. So we can see here where there's some work perhaps to um, stop such cooperation um, with um, Chinese and Russian entities. Um, on an international level, uh, we have already, uh, Danielle has already um, explained some of the uh, dynamics happening. Um, in the UN discussions on cybersecurity, we've recently seen that uh, cooperation with Russia and China is possible. Um, we've seen, um, on a, and also on a broad international level, we've seen the UN group of governmental experts and the open-ended working group both issuing um, consensus reports. Um, negotiations on cybercrime convention will be occurring in 2022. And so, we might have different visions, of course, about um, different issues in cybersecurity, cybercrime, how we define them, whether it's information security, right? And here, of course, Western countries need to be very careful. Um, you know, definitions that permit for extensive surveillance shouldn't slip in, right? Or for, um, for instance, cybercrime measures being taken into um, wrong directions. So they have to be careful there. Um, and um, so we shouldn't, um, for instance, have uh, free speech um, being um, a cyber crime, right? Um, violating the content regulations within um, some more authoritarian leaning countries. So just to sum up, um, there is space cooperation um, and uh, maybe we can uh, later on um, start or uh, continue on that discussion uh, where there can be cooperation, where they um, there shouldn't be cooperation, um, but um, that's all for my side for now. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, uh, for, for this uh, presentation, Valentin. Um, one thing that you mentioned in the, in the very beginning, and I think it's, it's interesting to, to have the parallel between uh, Russia and China, that Western companies should actually comply with, uh, with China's uh, regulations when it comes to, to content. How is this different from, uh, from the Russian case? So there are many measures how um, governments or authorities within Russia and China can um, get um, compliance of Western companies, right? They might um, put um, pressure on them by saying you need to censor this content. They might um, uh, introduce um, certain regulation, right? That might um, 
uh, require, um, for instance, data being localized, whether in Russia or China. And so there's really a lot of measures and sometimes they probably um, mirror each other, whether it's um, data localization, for instance, right? Um, then there's a very different dynamic, though, if they can actually implement what they want to um, do, right? So here, China has much more um, force um, to get Western companies what they want to do in Russia. A lot of Western companies still have a um, American companies, to be honest, actually have um, a lot of strong market position, whether it's Google, whether it's a um, search engine. So if you shut them down, then this has a major impact on users within Russia, which means that you can't have, you can't really easily do it. That's why also Russia perhaps throttles Twitter traffic in order not to have too big of a backlash. So you can see they have inventive ways of um, implementing their um, measures, but it's, I think in their, what they want to do, they implement similar measures. But what they can do, they, they differ um, quite strongly, the two countries. We'll have more time during the discussion to focus on the security aspects of uh, the, the strategies of the, the two uh, countries. But uh, before that, I think uh, very often when we talk about uh, surveillance or, or um, uh, online, uh, the online space, we more often talk about the economic aspects. And I think that this is important because uh, we cannot actually contextualize political surveillance uh, when, when we talk about Russia and China without thinking also about the, the economic aspects of, uh, of, of, of their actions. And uh, with, with this note, I would like to invite uh, Dr. La Lauren Johnson to uh, to make her introductory speech, and she's going to focus on the bigger uh, context, the, the bigger economic context uh, of China's tech push. And meanwhile, I, I would like to also say that uh, uh, I already uh, see that uh, Dr. Uh, Lisa Gaufman is with us. Welcome uh, once again to the panel. Uh, all our viewers, everybody who is online, Please write your questions. I saw already a couple of comments and questions on, on our uh, website. So this is the way to join the discussion and uh, to, of course, interact with our speakers. Now, Lauren, the, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can, can you see my screen? No. Um, okay, so I'm going to really give, I'm not talking about Russia at all. I'll be talking about China and this new era and the implications of this phase of, of its growth. Um, some of the other speakers have really highlighted that China is the, you know, it's the elephant in the room of this story. In any case, it's the one exporting to Russia. It's exporting technology to the world um, and doing that on a, on a win-win basis, as the first speaker had said. So I'm just going to talk about how did, you know, that there seems to be some broader global surprise that China is where it is. I'm going to talk about how it kind of got here and in a way that it's now kind of on like an exponential ascent and that it's that tech offers an angle to both of its current economic issues and the implications and areas for, for cooperation around that. So this is just the, the backdrop is, you know, China's birth rate or its total fertility rate peaked in the 1960s. And what that means is that for the 2020s and 2030s, there's a tsunami of retirees. But, you know, China isn't rich yet. It's still a developing country and it needs to be able to provide for all those retirees at the same time as continuing its economic growth and, you know, to continuing to reach the frontier. But already, like for a decade now, the working age population share has been falling. Soon the population will start declining, you know, but you have this, this like half a billion pensioners to provide for probably at peak. So how do you do that while continuing to develop? And actually, they've, they've been thinking about this for a long time because that descent of the total fertility rate was a function of policy. It, was a, it wasn't only, but, but it was a function of the one child policy. So, you know, basically they've had this kind of long run strategy that they understood from the 1980s, you know, into the early 2000s, they would be very, very rich in labor quality. So China at that point was, um, sorry, in labor quantity. So China at that point was all about 
setting up factories and just basic um, technology development, getting the kind of foundations. But alongside that, slowly developing some clusters of technology and some clusters of engineers and so on, in order that when this working age population share began to fall, when they got old before rich, they would have clusters of technological capacity, maybe not the entire country, but at least frontier clusters that would be able to help underpin growth once labor quantity had run out and wages started rising and so on. So people are kind of shocked now that this phase of China is, has come to the fore. But actually, if you followed the demographics and the demographic and economic demography story over the last 20, 30 years, it's really not a surprise that this comes now. And so it's kind of, it's got Xi's face on it, but she just happens to be the president at this point in time. Um, and so, you know, by the 2010s, you see this focus on universities and, and technology. And I always go back to in 1998, when China, um, when the one child policy kids reached university, China actually increased dramatically the number of places available. You know, so this kind of much more quality capital intensive focus of growth for their period. And then, you know, so pushing through that and also searching for growth abroad. So this slide just kind of tells, it doesn't go up to the present, but the point is that also China's outbound investment overtook inbound investment in the 19, sorry, in um, 2014. So again, this is a kind of a long run trend that if you'd followed it, you would see that by around 2014, China would start exporting or investing in the areas of its economic strengths. Um, and so, you know, the Belt and Road was launched one year before that turning point, probably not a coincidence. They kind of, they, they match well. And so you see, so this is the, the map of the Belt and Road. Less spoken about is that the, the five pillars of the launch speak in Kazakhstan, which is strengthening policy communication. Of course, that would include digital policy communication, strengthening road connectivity. That really refers to all infrastructure. So that includes telephone masts. That includes even digital trade, um, digital trade technology and basis inside the ports um, that, that are being built promoting unimpeded trade, strengthening currency circulation, that also has a digital element, as we see with the development of the digital currency, people to people ties, this is, you know, all online almost now, as well as visits and training. Um, and so, like, I, I bring this up because I think this is a kind of a, a it's part of China's market search, searching, that it's pushing its technologies as a form of development, as a form of global development, but also as a, as a form of, norm, of, of normalizing its technology, in part to these yellow and green countries, which are the poor countries. So the yellow ones are poor and old, and the green ones are poor and young. So therefore they're, 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 they're vulnerable with that in the sense that they're not rich. The red ones are very rare, they're rich and young, and the blue ones are rich and old. So really these green countries are the, the huge market of tomorrow in principle. And the yellow countries are vulnerable old countries and that includes both Russia and China. So you have a large share of old population who are not particularly well off necessarily. Um, and so they need to be able to keep growing through and they may even be politically more vulnerable because you have pensioners who maybe are trying to seek a share of resources that is completely incompatible with growth, like in Brazil or so on. So you'll have this much greater political volatility and vulnerability in those yellow countries, but perhaps the green ones too, because there's lots of unemployed young people. So that's the kind of global political economy. And remember that the yellow ones are probably the hungriest for growth, or at least on, they're all hungry for growth, but on the surface. And so, you know, what is China's response? Like in order to push through that, yellow frontier, so to speak, and enter the blue frontier, which is rich and old. You know, they have all of the, the technology um, policies. I'm not an expert in all of them. There's many, many applying to AI, applying to semiconductors, applying to space. Um, the less obvious agenda is, is the one I want to talk about, which is, for example, how population aging. So population aging is seen as a growth impediment for China. How will China be able to grow through 
having half a billion retirees. Um, they will do that very, very cleverly by, they have this very proactive way to, of the medium and long-term plan for population aging is the most recent, 2019. And then very, very recently, this month, this um, smart healthcare industry plan, for example, focuses on combining technology and aging in one. So I think uh, an earlier speaker brought up health and health biotechnology and health rights. And then other speakers have brought up um, geo positioning and the dual use of that, like really in this management of 500 million pensioners is where all this comes into one, where, you know, you have, there, there will be a focus on, in order to avoid them going into nursing homes, you set up technology in the home that monitors if people fall over or if somebody stops using their water supply or, you know, all these triggers so that you can follow up and, and preserve the health and life expectancy and independent living of old people, all of which obviously have broader implications. But this is really the only way it's going to be cost effective for China to manage 500 million pensioners. So you see this kind of, you know, on the surface, it looks as if China's population aging is going to be a negative for growth, but actually it offers it's being framed to offer a new frontier of tech and digitization and people management such that China can keep growing and people can live independently. So it's, it's very much a win-win. And then, you know, do people to prefer to live at home and have their home AI infused or do they prefer to live in a nursing home? And I'm sure even their children would prefer them to live in an AI infused home rather than with them and they take care of them all day. So these are the kind of cost benefit analysis There's so many trade-offs. And then, you know, this tech heavy population aging, you have this just this week or last week, the Shanghai Data Exchange was launched. So how to take all this data and create a market for it, how to make it available to other consumers and so on. So, so to turn this new data into a new growth frontier because the old growth model has worn out, it's gone. So China is looking for every type of innovative frontier to keep the economy growing through this population aging, which will have all these spin-off benefits and costs for privacy, for you know all, all these other issues and all these dual use concerns. So then, and then the smart healthcare industry, as I said, and this includes brain body interface, um, semiconductors, all sorts of technology that will support both, both areas. And then finally, you've got the digital currency which underpins a lot of this, like, like that provides data that, is, that has never been seen before almost. It's like, a, it's like the DNA code of economic activity will be available lifetime um, in the form of data constantly. So, and then the BRI basically fits, is the same principle, but you know, creating remarkable new opportunity built on digitization. So you can have many more people involved in trade. You can have farmers in Rwanda able to put their coffee on the global market, like a very small farmer. So you can address poverty much more quickly, much more directly, much more instantaneously. And all of this is, is being talked about at, at FOCAC as, as we speak. Um, and then, you know, this strengthening currency circulation, no one ever talks about it, but that comes back again to the digital Currency. So you see it all kind of fits in. And if, if you take it to the company side, you have like Alibaba, maybe a bit, a bit less than a decade ago, started this new kind of trade frontier called the Electronic World Trade Platform with a base in, with a base in Brussels, sorry, with a base in Liege in Belgium, one in Rwanda, one in Ethiopia, one in Malaysia. That's so far. And these are, these are, Digital, digitally enhanced trade hubs that provide for ultimately for digitized customs, digitized finance, digitized trade pro so like much more instantaneous and small medium enterprise dominated trade and digital currency will enhance that. So, you know, you'll have this kind of matrix of much more instantaneous, much more fast, much less labor intensive trade and that in turn will provide all this data, which can then be traded on those markets. And so you kind of see how it facilitates less labor intensive growth 
and also growth in these young, you know, poor countries that that want growth. Um, so and then so tech heavy. So it's like a, a you know these some of the 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 phones and the ports, as I said, they're they're very digitally enhanced. This isn't about building some old style port. It's about building a digitized digital frontier from Senegal to to um, you know Dubai uh, or a, a digital enhanced trade base and for that Huawei and so on is building the infrastructure and then one of China's advantages and you know this this does allow them to have some influence on standards but you know they provide to people across all income groups so they make phones for the poorest people to to you know develop their own lives to communicate with their own families some of those phones include you know, apps that, that will enable them to kind of enter this digital frontier already. So they're pre-embedded with apps that can enable them to later on access world trade and, and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a strategy to enter these young markets that enables China to keep growing and that does, on the other hand, foster some of these technological, you know, elements of risk of standard setting and, and, and so on. Um, so does that present a, a risk for democracies? I, I'll go back to the kind of economic demography story just because I, I, I think this is a part that's maybe understudied and underappreciated, you know, that China has crafted this very, very long term, in my view, I don't know if it's true, I've not heard a, a, a Chinese state official claim it, but this very long term kind of approach to, to population aging so that aging itself will serve as a, as a real platform for the next phase of technological growth with all the implications for privacy and so on. Um, whereas, you know, the Western countries and then, you know, in Eastern Europe and with Russia, some countries are old before rich, so they have the same political volatility or political brittleness maybe. Um, you know, Czech and Poland have got rich after they got old. So you still have a, a kind of a very different political economy where you probably have a whole lot of old people who are not particularly rich. And so one of the speakers yesterday, the head of cybersecurity for Czech, mentioned this, this impact of leadership and politics on how cybersecurity happens. He said it wasn't as much a tech issue as it is a, a, a political issue. And, and I think how countries react and how they're willing to adapt and to workers groups in part does play a role in, in this kind of political economy of, of the aged in each different place, whether it's poor and old, rich and old, and how the country is searching out new markets. And so for, for a suggestion on my part, I think in terms of the EU, I think there should be a much bigger focus across the younger cohorts because I think they're far more equal. You know, if you look at the population of Eastern Europe and Western Europe from an older angle, these people have had incredibly different lives, whereas the younger populations haven't. So, uh, you know, they've had a, a more similar life. So there may be a capacity to, to develop a consensus and, and a long-term trajectory there. Um, and, and in any case, just as what China is, you know, for if any of these, you know, from um, the funders of this, this conference to any public official, if there's a desire for a lot of resources to compete with China or, or to be able to fund technological research and so on, then at least manage this long run economic story, economic demography story, the way China is. Don't do what China's doing, but you have to make the most of, of this, this kind of aging story just the way China is. We won't even have the resources to compete. Like, this is a, a, a super issue. And the rich old countries might even be might even be in a more dangerous position. And you know, there's this this in a Chinese paper I read in Chinese this week, it highlighted that only Israel and South Korea among the OECD spend more money on education than pensions. But the entire rest of the OECD spends more money each year on pensions than on education. And the implication is once you make that switch then you're not in, you're probably going to undermine your future productivity. So these, you know, it doesn't seem that important today, but in terms of preserving resources, China has a super clever long run approach. And I, and I think all countries can learn from it. And also from the implications for 
implementation of cybersecurity and privacy and, and, and so on to just understand that difference. So on potential areas of cooperation, um, I, I really emphasize that point about learning from China's quite clever long run approach um, to economic demography and how that is integrated into technology. Um, and there's probably, I would guess, I mean, on the aging, it's a focus of mine, but given the integration of managing 500 million pensioners and the technological frontier from AI, AI geoposition location monitoring to medical data, I, I think there's room and logic to cooperate on aging relating technologies, especially inclusiveness techniques to keep older populations willing to engage and invest in technology, AI governance and so on, so they don't feel shut out. And it may be more likely in the West that it will be the old who cut, cut, cut off the progress because they're very politically active. Um, and also understand China's digital approach in third markets. What's working, what isn't working? Why is, you know, why are these countries signing on? And, and are there ways to, enable those countries to perhaps adopt European technological values if that's what their populations want, having already chosen Chinese infrastructure, like to some kind of dual approach to maybe China has built their infrastructure, but is it those values that, that the people want? Obviously, that's a, a much bigger story. And then this digital currency, this digital evolution, I, I think the scale of the impact of the data this will create and its value has not begun to be digested and, and what it means. So I think there needs to be a lot more preparation on management of the privacy and the, the data value implications. And China is at the frontier of that thinking. So it's probably worth learning from China in terms of what their thinking is already they obviously have different intent for how to use, they have their own intent for how they'll use that data. But in order to best preserve the adoption of technology with European values, as was said in, in the earlier session, really need to understand precisely those details and everything that will change. And also how China is making that interoperable with other countries already. So they're focusing on UAE, Thailand, and Cambodia to start. But, you know, so, so in terms of navigating the difficult terrain of digital currencies, it, it might be also worth looking at what is Cambodia, UAE, and Thailand thinking in this sense already? Like, how can this be made interoperable on the best possible privacy and, and you know, data, the best use of data, it's best to start talking about that as soon as possible. Um, yeah, thank you. This was uh, like a really fascinating presentation. Uh, thank you, Laura. And the, the link between economic uh, demography and, and uh, the Chinese technological growth actually helps us to, um, to contextualize uh, the, the, the concept of, uh, of uh, political surveillance and also technological surveillance, um, uh, looking at, at the, the economic strategy of China, not only internally, but also externally. And I think that uh, the implications for, uh, for security and for, for other countries uh, in this context is something that it will be curious to look at during the, uh, the Q&A session and uh, our discussion which is a reminder for our viewers to just uh, join us and uh, ask questions on, on our website and also leave your comments there. Now I would like to uh, give the floor uh, to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Elisaveta Gaufman or Lisa Gaufman, uh, if she prefers. Uh, she will be speaking uh, on the local Russian policy context of surveillance, infrastructure, and um, of course, if we, if we have the time, we can cover additional aspects related to, to the Telegram ban. The floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind of invitation, and I'm uh, glad to join the panel here. Um, so, uh, as, uh, uh, as was mentioned, I'm uh, focusing more on the local Russian context um, and how uh, the, the whole idea of surveillance actually functions in Russia and why is it a, a matter of concern 
for um, Russians and the Russian government specifically. So if I had to uh, name my talk, I would call it uh, The Major is Listening. So this is actually a reference to a, a lot of jokes that Russian citizens uh, used to make and still make now about uh, the kind of surveillance practices that existed back in Soviet Union and uh, still exist now to an extent. So uh, people you would make jokes about how uh, a comrade major or major uh, is listening through the bugs in the electric sockets or telephones or um, is uh, somewhere uh, around here when you're uh, when you're in conversation with somebody. So this kind of uh, running gag of major is listening is still um, to an extent um, true right now uh, in, in the Russian Federation. But again, if we look at the, a lot of the um, expert opinions on uh, uh, the extent of Russian surveillance, uh, uh, the consensus is that Russia, is, the Russian government can still not do the mass scale surveillance as uh, the NSA, for example, or uh, China. And uh, the, the problem here is that uh, why is surveillance such, a, such an issue in Russia is that uh, because the Russian internet or RUNET, in, as it's called in Russia, is, has been designated as a threat to regime stability. Uh, and uh, it has been securitized to such an extent that um, a lot of the Russian government officials would, uh, whenever there's some kind of, uh, let's say, popular unrest or uh, even um, disagreement with the governmental policy, it would be always referred to the fact that um, it's some kind of external influence through, let's say, servers in California, which is a quote from one of the governmental officials in Russia. So servers in California, uh, people through servers in California trying to influence uh, regime stability in Russia. And uh, even though Russia does enjoy a status of a cyber superpower uh, abroad, uh, it's still domestically, it's struggling to create a fully national and digitally sovereign uh, internet, even though there are obviously a lot of uh, different um, projects to uh, accomplish that. So to create a kind of a switch that would uh, uh, separate Russian internet from the rest of the internet infrastructure in the world. And uh, obviously the Chinese example is the kind of, uh, uh, example that the Russian uh, authorities are definitely uh, looking up to. Um, so even though uh, the government uh, has been uh, policing and censoring the digital space for a while now, uh, it, uh, as of now, uh, it has the digital space has become more vulnerable to traffic disruption uh, for private users. And the attempted at telegram ban of the 2018 actually showed how incredibly vulnerable the uh, Russian internet structure is uh, whenever you try to actually implement those kind of surgical um, strikes of uh, banning some infra internet infrastructure. And uh, uh, why this whole idea of um, uh, the service in California trying to mess with the Russian regime stability, it's also related to uh, a certain understanding of, um, uh, of the so-called Third World War among the Russian military um, experts. So uh, if we take a look at the Western scholarship on the, let's say, Third World War, or even uh, digital Pearl Harbors or weapons of mass disruption, so that kind of uh, ideas of what can be uh, what, what can have a negative effect on the, on uh, certain countries. Uh, this is not the way the Russian military experts see it. If you read Russian military experts, they would all talk about how the Third World War is supposed to be informational, psychological, and uh, that uh, the uh, other governments are trying to sort of uh, infiltrate Russian social media and influence the population and then um, break up Russia again. So this is kind of a deeply conspiratorial belief. It still comes from a lot of uh, conspiracy theories theories that were very popular in the 90s, uh, the so-called Dulles plan, that's uh, still a very popular conspiracy theory in Russia. But this, um, but still, it, it, it does influence the Russian military um, elite uh, to an extent that they even uh, emphasize the need to develop armed forces and means for an information confrontation. So they're all so much so concerned with the fact that um, there's an information war against Russia that uh, they also think that that's why it's also important to, let's say, surveil and censor digital space, because that's where the threat is coming from. It's coming from abroad, it's coming from through the servers in California. And uh, um, what kind of surveillance is there actually? So uh, the way it, act, it works is uh, that ever, ever since uh, 1995, uh, the Federal Security Service uh, has um, uh, 
try to um, to identify threats to Russian political stability, and um, uh, in in order to uh, to accomplish this uh, goal of ensuring political stability, some of the uh, Russian uh, communication was start were uh, monitored ever since 1995. So uh, this is the uh, so the system for operative investigative activities SORM in Russian. Uh, so this system was created in 1995 and uh, pretty much uh, supposed to intercept uh, some telecommunications, telephone networks, uh, but it's supposed to be targeted and not mass surveillance uh, of both telephone and in internet communications in Russia. And um, uh, so this uh, SORM system was implemented uh, in order to en enable FSB, so Russian Federal Security Service, to um, access the, uh, the communication. And uh, um, even though technically it has not been entirely legal, and there's been also uh, uh, some complaints uh, at the um, uh, European Convention on Human Rights that is, is an European uh, court that is supposed to European Court of Human Rights also ruled unanimously that the Russian legal provisions do not provide for adequate and effective guarantees against arbitrariness and the risk of abuse, which is inherent in uh, uh, any system of secret surveillance. And uh, if you uh, take a look at even some of the investigative journalism that is happening in Russia, you can see that a lot of it actually relies on the fact that uh, a lot of the databases actually leaked all the time in Russia. So the um, Private data is constantly on the market within Russia, and it's even unclear whether this data is being sold by security services or some kind of random uh, private agents who uh, who just want to get rich off of that. So, for example, a lot of the um, uh, Navalny investigations were, in fact, based on some of this um, uh, data, private data that was leaked or bought by uh, by his colleagues. Um, and if we take a look at the infrastructure levels of control in Russia, uh, the way it works is you have uh, three infrastructure levels there. So the first one is Rostelikom. Uh, uh, so this is the pretty much the uh, provider of broadband internet already. So it uh, cooperates uh, with the Russian agency of Roskomnadzor. Uh, uh, nice acronym in Russian, but uh, it sounds uh, exactly what it does. So it actually um, feel, uh, it's supposed to monitor the activities uh, that are happening on on the Russian internet. And Rostelikom, uh, uh, so the uh, so the uh, infrastructure, the broadband provider, is actually supposed to filter and block the content that violates uh, the legislation based on um, censoring uh, Russian digital space. And uh, secondly, given that local companies and platforms such as um, Yandex or Vkontakte, uh, they're much more popular than uh, Google or Facebook, uh, Roskomnadzor can actually regulate access to information through, uh, uh, through several of their tools uh, because it has a database of a local website on uh, the Russian internet. And of course, the big Russian tech companies are supposed to comply with that, uh, with that database. And even recent uh, uh, scandals about uh, that apparently some of Russian um, AI, like uh, the Russian analog of Alexa, which is Alisa, uh, the kind of uh, um, the the, the so you would actually supposed to um, even provide uh, some of the complaints or some kind of information that might be detrimental to the safety uh, to the uh, federal security services, which is a very worrying um, development. And of course, Roskomnadzor, uh, uh, so which is the this is the agency that is that deals with the uh, policing of the of the digital space, has also uh, secured the cooperation of a technical center that also. Um, uh, operates the main registry of runet domain name system so uh, which means that uh, there is like a, a, a under the new uh, sovereign internet law uh, there's going to be like this one list of there's going to be a list of things that are accessible to people in Russia uh, uh, on the internet and but even uh, without the sovereign internet uh, Roskomnadzor can already have a say in information that flows as uh, DNS translates uniform resource locators uh, URLs into IP addresses and acts as a type of phone book that Roskomnadzor is allowed to edit so, which means that uh, uh, Roskomnadzor is actually can edit the kind of URLs that uh, people are allowed to access. So, um, even though there is this, uh, there are three levels of um, infrastructure control that exists in Russia. There's still obviously ways to avoid that some of that uh, um, some of that censorship by, let's say, uh, using VPNs, so virtual private networks. So, but again, even because of that, uh, the use of VPNs has also been uh, somewhat restricted in Russia. And uh, uh, some of the uh, 
like the goal here, like why is it all censoring is working, is that obviously that the government is afraid that the uh, that the regime stability is under threat. Uh, but uh, there are several uh, projects uh, in in Russia, sponsored by the Russian government that are supposed to actually uh, isolate uh, Russian intent from the rest of the of the world. So one of them is um, uh, so-called information uh, society. It's a federal program, and uh, the goal of that uh, program is to have ninety percent of internet traffic transmitted domestically, as opposed to, uh, I think in 2014, it was about 70%. So like increasing the amount of domestic traffic. And uh, even the Russian culture minister, Medinsky, he at some point even entered, uh, stated that um, people will have to show their passport to um, enter internet. Uh, and it's not just like what Russia does, it's all the countries in the world who do that. So this kind of um, uh, always trying to justify some of the restrictive measures based on the so-called Western experience. And um, uh, and he, when, whenever he was discussing this uh, option, he was also talking about that uh, the Russian state needs a parental control on devices in Russia, which obviously the state being the parents and the uh, citizens being the children that needs to be protected from the uh, bad information. And uh, uh, another option is obviously uh, the so-called uh, Great Chinese Firewall, which is also something that uh, the Russian uh, government is definitely um, uh, definitely considering. But again, there are uh, there are not enough um, infrastructural and. And uh, other capabilities to actually ensure that uh, kind of siphoning off the Russian internet from the rest of the world. Um, and uh, the uh, experts on uh, Russian internet, for example, uh, Irina Baragan and Andrei Soldatov, uh, they also uh, think that there, the, um, uh, the measures will definitely increase uh, and uh, they will increase the measures for uh, possibilities and capabilities for mass surveillance. But right now it's not, it's not as massive as, um, as uh, most people actually are afraid of. And um, uh, one of the cases in point was, uh, for example, as I mentioned, the ban, uh, the, uh, the attempt to ban a Telegram in 2018, which was actually officially unbanned in 2020. Uh, but uh, because uh, when, when the Russian government actually tried to ban it, uh, it created so many disruptions uh, for regular users, for uh, regular um, uh, for online uh, commerce, and uh, even the some of the governmental websites, that um, it was uh, it just truly proved that at that point in time, and even the fact that the Russian government actually unbanned it 2020 showed that at, right now the the, go the government is not capable of actually um, of performing this kind of mass scale operation, and uh, as you probably know Telegram is banned in China and is banned partially uh, in Iran because Telegram was in fact connected to a lot of the protest activity and a lot of the uh, social mobilization activities and that's why um, it was also um, the Russian authorities tried to ban it as well. Um, it's even though Telegram is technically developed by the same person who developed Contacte, so another very popular Russian uh, social network, uh, Contacte fully cooperates uh, with the Russian security services, and that's why, and also it, it's no longer owned by uh, Pavel Durov, who created it. And uh, because of that, uh, uh, Telegram, for example, banned uh, uh, Navalny's, uh, so Alexei Navalny, uh, the famous Russian oppositional. Uh, politician, uh, the Telegram actually banned uh, his bot uh, on Telegram that uh, was supposed to help people decide uh, who to vote for in the Russian uh, elections. Even at the same time, uh, Telegram used, uh, uh, refused to ban uh, a far-right organization that's called the Mail State that was pretty much doxing feminist activists all over Russia and uh, spreading hate speech, uh, very racist, xenophobic um, uh, posts all, all over the place about, for about 86,000 uh, subscribers, so they refused to actually ban it uh, when when feminist activists asked them to do. So it's kind of uh, um, let's say walking a tightrope for some of those um, requirements for uh, free speech and uh, uh, siding with authorities. The um, Telegram actually uh, kind of caved to the Russian authorities um, in many ways. Although I have to say that uh, the mail state has been, in fact, uh, outlawed uh, by a court in Nizhny Novgorod. So uh, thankfully now uh, his, uh, their activities are no longer accessible for uh, Russian citizens. So um, what is um, uh, important also to notice is that um, 
blocking one platform has impacts on the operations of other platforms and complete replacement of foreign platforms with domestic alternatives or strategic ownership through a market monopoly would require enormous financial and technological resources. Uh, and this is uh, so far not entirely possible. So um, to conclude, I would say that uh, the major is listening, uh, but not as much, and uh, he is not capable to listen as much as he wants to. And there are uh, mostly kind of surgical strikes against activists and people involved in oppositional activities. So for example, there are, um, uh, if people are arrested, let's say for some kind of controversial post on social media, they're usually because they're already uh, being monitored by uh, secret services in, in Russia as, as they were. So it's not uh, that all the uh, people who might say some kind of, um, let's say uh, some kind of hate speech on, on social media, they, not all of them would be arrested. And uh, for a, a, a glaring example for that would be the use of, of contact, so Russian social media, uh, again, under control of the security services, where you can find a lot of uh, hate speech against Ukrainians, but it's uh, not prosecuted because it, uh, it falls somewhere within the official line because there was a lot of anti-Ukrainian sentiment in the Russian government. So uh, even there is uh, something that would definitely qualify as hate speech, people who, act, who post that on Vkontakte would not be prosecuted because it's sort of within the governmental line. And um, uh, it seems like based on a, a lot of experts who've been studying Russian intent for a while, um, they, would, uh, they concur that uh, Russian authorities would love to emulate the Chinese model, but they can't do that yet. Uh, so, um, as of now, uh, there are obviously attempts to, um, to separate the Russian internet from the rest of the world and to, um, to monitor the, especially the opposition activities uh, online. And, um, uh, and this is also the kind of dilemma that Russian uh, oppositional activists have, or whether they choose visibility or vulnerability uh, in front of Russian authorities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this really, really uh, interesting presentation. Uh, once again, Elizabeth Gaufman, Gaufman about uh, the, 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 the local context, how actually political surveillance and new technologies are used in the context of Russia. Now, there is a question from uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Tyson Barker, and I think that you touched upon uh, uh, the, 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 the issue of, uh, of Contacte and the case of Contacte. But um, there is uh, like a broader question. He asks, is there any shift towards adoption of Chinese platform in, uh, platforms in Russia or an attempt to grow uh, indigenous actors to eat uh, the US market share? Can you talk a bit uh, more about Contacte in this, in this sense? So if you ever use Contacte, you would see that it's eerily similar to Facebook. It's because it was pretty much a, like a bootleg copy of Facebook when it was created back, uh, back in the day by Pavel Durov. And um, I think that um, uh, there is, in fact, some kind of um, fear, or not, both on the grassroots level and also on the uh, governmental level, of uh, Chinese software and uh, uh, Chinese companies. So um, there are... Uh, so the social media that are used in Russia are uh, the most popular are the ones that actually are um, in, well, indigenous to Russia. So you have Contacte, for example, or Telegram that was also created by a Russian developer. So uh, these are the kind of things that are popular in Russia. But um, they're obviously, uh, let's say, um, the big market giants like uh, Alibaba is also extremely popular in Russia. Uh, so, uh, but again, uh, I think the emphasis would still be on the um, homegrown uh apps and tech giants because they are uh, it's much easier to get them to comply with the russian uh, legislation that is uh, that is aimed at uh, policing the digital space so uh, even though facebook and twitter have been and youtube also have been fined and uh, uh, for uh, censoring or for allowing some kind of content that russian government is not happy with but um, the set of laws that's supposed to regulate uh, the kind of traffic uh, and where the the uh, russian data is stored uh, the so-called Yaravaya law. Uh, so this all uh, is um, very much easier to implement when all the tech giants are situated on your own territory. And uh, well, I, I would I would say that I don't think that the Russian government would want to mess with the Chinese government as much. And I don't think that they would actually be, uh, I, I think they would be willing to cooperate uh, with the Chinese government to um, kind of, uh, to, uh, uh, to have the influence of uh, so Western countries, uh, to lessen the influence of Western countries, but uh, they would not be uh, entirely willing to let 
a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the Chinese companies inside Russia because that would threaten their own um, um, monopoly over uh, digital censorship. So we have a couple of more questions on our web page, and I will try to um, maybe each of you can 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 take uh, one question until the end of this panel. Um, I think Daniela and Valentin uh, can engage with uh, with the question of information operations and uh, what information operations actually uh, from the re in the recent years uh, you find particularly interesting. I would add from security point of view. And what uh, does this tell us about future trends? What can we expect knowing already the approaches of China and Russia and the way they engage with uh, technological and political surveillance? What, what, is, uh, what is your expectation? Maybe Daniela first and then Valentin. Well, like one thing I looked at is not necessarily like national policies, but more these regional policies. And I think this Operation Proxy is like a very good example of this, that you see that like in the context of these regional organizations, um, these countries work together and really actively exchange expertise. Uh, and what they do, I think, is every year they uh, basically try to list as many uh, internet websites as they can, and they try to take them offline, right? And Russia plays an important role in this, like providing um, expertise, practical assistance, um, but also training of, um, uh, of experts. Um, does that tell us something about future trends? I think it just shows that there's this very active attempt. Like, it's not just like national policies. There's this very, very active attempt of like trying to work together with several countries to make these security operations more effective. Um, and try to like really improve the policies um, in these areas in exchange of um, best practices. All right, and now to Valentin. Yeah, I'll just very shortly um, add um, one or two sentences because <laughs> time is um, I'm short, but um, I would say that um, in the recent um, Ghostwriter campaign um, where we have seen Russia actually um, allegedly um, targeting also uh, German lawmakers um, and lawmakers in other European countries um, through cyber-enabled um, information um, operations. Um, those were sometimes um, carried out and sometimes only attempted um, where um, they were targeting um, lawmakers and then perhaps not yet have um, released that um, data. But what's interesting here, is in that specific Ghostwriter um, campaign, um, it was allegedly not only Russia, but there was also some um, Belor um, Belarusian um, actors involved there. So we can see some interesting, um, actually, um, operations um, attributed by um, that was Mandiant, which is a fire, um, uh, which is a um, cybersecurity company, attributed actually um, that a Ghostwriter campaign both to um, Russia and um, in another report also to Belarus. So we can see that kind of an interesting um, trend that it's not always as clear who is conducting the information operations or if it's the sole country um, um, operating those um, campaigns. I think about future trends, we can just, I think it's a safe bet to always. Um, expect a following of the national interest, right? What is the national interest of Russia? What is the national interest of China? Um, information operations abroad often um, follow those um, those interests, right? How they try to shape discourse, um, which um, relate to the, to the reputation of those two countries, but also perhaps of other goals, perhaps of destabilizing um, electoral processes abroad. So I think that's a quite um, perhaps a way to look how those information operations could evolve in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And one question which I think that we already started discussing when it comes to uh, the, the role of Western companies, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Johnson can, can take this question. Lauren, should the EU, US companies, uh, and actually the US government is, is written in this question, in, intervene in businesses of US tech companies in China when it comes to surveillance policies, uh, as they can be seen as uh, morally questionable. This is what uh, our viewer asks on our website. I think US companies need to make their decision on that. I mean, if they become 
branded so negatively for engaging in those practices, then not only are they engaging in what would be considered morally challenging issues, but that in the long run may also hurt their bottom line. Um, so I, I guess different companies are differently exposed to those particular challenges. And, you know, then there's, there's a, there's a long-term consequences and short-term consequences. I, I, I think it's quite hard to just draw a extremely black and white line. Um, and each of them is obviously making an incredibly difficult decision. It's China is probably now one of the world's most innovative tech markets, yet it doesn't operate in the same way as those companies and their shareholders would, would desire. And so being engaged is morally indefensible. Taking themselves out you know, it offers different challenges in the long term. So I think this is an incredibly difficult, very, very challenging situation. And each different company will be making their own decisions around that. Um, the moral consequences are obviously enormous. Um, so one would hope there are ways they can work out how to hold to those principles and stay at the frontier. So to do that, they need to be more dexterous than they were in the past. Thank you. And one question uh, for Elisabetta Gaufman. Russia works clearly with plausible deniability approach. Is there an effective way to counter this and make Russia responsible? I'm afraid I have to disappoint the person who asked about that question. I'm afraid no. Uh, at this point, I, uh, that's actually the reason why uh, even uh, if you take a look at the intelligence reports and the U.S. Congress, uh, there is a lot of the, um, even all of these uh, reports compiled by intelligence agencies, they, they cannot all say that uh, with 100% certainty that this was Russia who did, let's say, uh, attack the servers or um, something like that. So uh, I'm not sure that there is a way to hold the Russian government responsible. And uh, I think that uh, also a lot of the, uh, some of those activities, uh, let's say, um, the trolling or something like that, uh, there is obviously something that uh, the actual platforms can do. So let's say uh, Twitter released the, uh, the data set where you can actually analyze the, uh, the trolling, uh, the, the Kremlin troll database uh, data. So you can actually analyze what they did to social media. You can, uh, Facebook would have done that too. Um, so uh, it's, it actually depends on also the platforms uh, to try and uh, uh, at least um, point out uh, how, to, um, how to handle some of those uh, activities uh, that were uh, associated with the Russian government. But yeah, I'm afraid that um, at, at this point, the answer is no, uh, there's no way to hold the Russian government responsible. And I would like to, co to conclude this panel with um, a question which uh, goes back to, to uh, the, the, the way we announced this, uh, this discussion today. What, from what we know about the, the Russian and the Chinese approaches to information operations, to um, digital surveillance and, and the new tools that technology offers, what we can expect and what we can say about um, their approach to warfare and how these tools are used in, um, in the context of global competition. And I think that we can uh, have a final round with a very quick comments from each of you before, uh, before closing the panel. Maybe to start uh, with, with Daniela. I think it's an interesting question. I think it's not just a question of technical capabilities, right? Like I think the argument I try to make is that a lot of it is also about like contesting this like open internet order, right? This idea that information can flow freely. So it's not just about how far can your capabilities go. And this is what we also see in the Russian case because they are limited in, in a certain sense, right? right? Because it's more of a decentralized infrastructure um, and they're more uh, dependent on external hardware and software. Um, but then on top of those capabilities also come this global discourse aspect of it, this idea that you do develop, try to develop international treaties or international norms um, that in some way might legitimize these practices. And this could 
also, well, maybe warfare is a big word, but this could also help legitimizing certain practices in the cybersecurity domain. Thank you. Valentin? I think you said it's a <clears throat> really interesting question. I would say if we had to look at surveillance and um, cyber operations um, and what the overlap is in, in the actions of China and Russia is, I would say that Russia has a more of a reckless um, behavior, whether it's uh, with regards to surveillance at home, they don't shy away from collateral damage, um, taking down part of the internet infrastructure uh, or of the internet um, if in order to, um, to, to implement um, censorship, as we have seen, at the same time, they're acting uh, quite recklessly abroad, right, when engaging in um, um, cyber operations um, abroad, um, as we have seen um, with um, several um, high, high profile um, cyber attacks against um, countries um, abroad um, that have been um, quite reckless. Recently with solo wins, perhaps they have become a bit less um, reckless, let's say. Um, China is um, being more subtle here, um, also at home when it comes um, to surveillance. Um, often you don't know that you're surveilled, often you don't know that you were censored because it just says um, your message couldn't be delivered. Um, and so in that way, they're a bit more subtle as well as with regards to cyber operations. Um, they have for a long time focused on IP theft, um, intellectual property theft um, in companies which weren't um, that much um, uh, featured, sometimes um, put um, under the, the carpet, right? But again, there's no black and white recently with the uh, proxy log on um, cyber operation. Um, China was also um, acting quite carelessly um, with um, no collateral damage in mind. So it's not so black and white, but I think we can see more or less um, these tendencies of the two countries um, going into these directions and probably also um, following these um, approaches and uh, and behaviors um, in the future. Thank you. Lauren, final notes? Um, I would encourage those in this space to really follow the demographic angle. Um, both the value and the importance of the young and poor countries, which obviously offer uh, a new space for the, of, for new digital norms, new technological norms. And these are very easy spaces to operate in because it's also very morally righteous to support improving living standards of very poor people. Um, so that is a that's a one type of contested space for you know looking looking forward to so these young and poor markets. And then on the other hand, I would not underestimate the difference of the poor old and the rich old population aging context. So you have the, the OECD countries, they're mostly rich old. And I think this is actually a much more difficult space to preserve the innovative frontier in and to preserve resources for the development of competitiveness and remaining at the frontier. Um, so, and then China being poor and old, on the one hand, it seems like they can't get old before rich, but actually they've had this amazing long run strategy and population aging itself is really becoming part of that strategy. So I, I really, you know, and even in terms of how countries politically can change and normalize, like how do you normalize a digital currency in Europe where people are much older on average and much more familiar with old ways of operating? So I think this demographics angle from so many perspectives of future markets, of pol political distribution and contestation needs much more um, embedding into the story to understand how to best embed the values that, that people here want to see em em embedded. Thank you. Thank you so much. And final, uh, final remarks from Elizabeth Gaufman. Um, I'll be brief. I'll just say that um, the, I think it's important to, uh, to remember that 
uh, the way uh, a lot of the Russian activities are viewed, this is actually not a proactive operation, it's more of a reactive operation. So a lot of the things that uh, we write about, like uh, the infamous uh, fake Gerasimov doctrine, is all based on the fact that this is what the Russian military and the Russian elite thinks the West is doing to Russia, and that's why they have to react a certain way. And that's why you have the Kremlin, Kremlin troll factory and all these activities, because uh, this is what the Russian government thinks uh, the West is trying to do to it. And I think this kind of reactive mode uh, is also something that has to be uh, kept in mind when we talk about um, uh, some of those uh, surveillance and uh, digital censorship uh, that is happening in Russia, especially uh, when it comes to the way the whole idea of digital surveillance has been legitimized as uh, a way to uh, keep Russia stable.